Spring 1982. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher had been in power for nearly three years. An economic recession and high unemployment had split the party and the country, and her domestic rating was at its lowest. But then an unexpected and distant war saw her popularity soar. Victory in the Falklands transformed Mrs. Thatcher's flagging fortune. It sealed her reputation as the Iron Lady. In time, it would secure her a second term in office. But why did Britain fight to save the fate of a sparsely populated and far-flung protectorate? The Falklands lie 300 miles east of the Argentine coast. Britain had occupied and administered the island since 1833 and had consistently rejected all claims to sovereignty by Argentina. But by 1966, this anomalous possession became the subject for successive British governments to explore if, with the right conditions attached, a different status could be negotiated. It was quite obvious at that time that the, the Argentinians were getting rather impatient um, and um, we came up with the idea of the, of the, of the leaseback. But of course, the, the, the problem with the leaseback was, first of all, that the right wing of the Conservative Party uh, felt outraged uh, that any, any bit of British territory should be ceded, even if there was a 200-year leaseback. And the Labour Party, the left wing of the Labour Party, they were outraged that you should cede any British territory to a right wing dictator. And the sensible people in the middle uh, didn't make uh, any noise at all. And so you were left at that time with nothing to negotiate with. With progress stalled, the Falklands issue slipped down the political agenda. And although by early 1982, General Galtieri was making increasingly bellicose noises regarding reclaiming the Malvinas, and there had been two incursions into South Georgia, the response of the British government was limited. We obviously discussed the Falklands, we discussed the antics of that group that went down to South Georgia allegedly to collect scrap. Um, and, um, but none of us seriously thought that the Argentinians would invade. Uh, that was, to the best of my recollection, that was never really on the agenda. Um, we thought there might be a blockading or a tightening up, of, but um, I don't recall people saying the Argentinians are going to invade. So when on Friday the 2nd of April 1982, Argentina did invade the Falklands, it caught most people by surprise. But with hindsight, almost everyone could point to the warning signs. People felt that probably we didn't react as fast and firmly, I'm not sure what we could do because South Georgia is about 800 miles out from the Falklands. Uh, but I think there was a feeling that we hadn't reacted as violently as we ought to have done when Steptoe and Son from Latin America landed on South Georgia and started dismantling the whaling station. They came back again too. Uh, and so my problem was that uh, people were prepared to lay the charge at me in lobby briefings that you brought it on yourself. The government too had been given specific warning of an invasion only two days earlier. The Ministry of Defence view, as retailed by John Knott, was that uh, before it, if they are taken, then they cannot be recovered. Well, Mrs Thatcher wondered what on earth, what kind of Ministry of Defence they got. I mean, uh, she was pretty grumpy about that. There's no way to start her. A problem is it? And then, uh, after the invasion had occurred, uh, Admiral Leach, I think he was chief of the naval staff, was summoned to a meeting in her room at the house. He couldn't find it. He was in mufti, so he was briefly detained by the authorities. Uh, but when a whip got him to Margaret Thatcher's room, she said, "Well, what you, what can you do? I can." Uh, I can assemble a task force in 48 hours. Well, you know, 
it's not the best start to recovering the Falklands to have a Ministry of Defence saying you can't and the Chief of the Naval Staff saying, I'm going to send a task force. <laughs> I mean, really, it was comic. you could argue it was a pretty comic actually, tragic comedy. So, just three days after the invasion, on the 5th of April, a task force set sail for the South Atlantic. Parliament had been informed of the plan during an emergency session two days before. It was a difficult time for Mrs Thatcher, but if she feared arguing the case for action in the Commons, she was mistaken. MPs of all parties were outraged, and the House was almost unanimous in backing the government. The most stirring speech call to arms, literally, against Galtieri and his fascist government was made by Michael Foote. It was clear from the first minutes that the Labour Party would be relentless in its opposition to Galtieri and to the invasion. As Mrs Thatcher would later recall in her memoirs, her announcement of the task force being ready to sail was greeted with growls of approval. The atmosphere was indescribable. I mean, the tension, the electricity, uh, the shame, if you like, the, that it had occurred, the anger, especially, I think, from opposition bench, absolute anger that this had occurred, and yet a determination as evinced by uh, Michael Fort, uh, we've got to get him off. On the same day the task force set sail, the Foreign Secretary resigned. I didn't anticipate at that time there was going to be an invasion because the, all, the in, all the intelligence that I was getting was that the Argentinians wouldn't do anything until they'd been to the United Nations and exhausted all the procedures there. And of course that was wrong. I mean, I don't particularly blame the intelligence people because, I mean, how, you, you know, people's intentions, <laughs> how, do you, how do you gauge that? Perhaps there is a moral that, uh, which could be, uh, could be perhaps uh, thought of in uh, current circumstances that you shouldn't rely too much on intelligence. <laughs> The speed at which the task force had been assembled was astounding. Extensive television coverage of its departure from Portsmouth gave the impression both of military strength and a proud nation prepared to fight to regain its lawful territory. But military action in difficult conditions 8,000 miles from home had to be a last option. Mrs Thatcher knew diplomacy must come first. Margaret Thatcher had a very uh, ambivalent attitude to the Foreign Office. As an institution, she was immensely suspicious of it. She thought, uh, I've always felt she was a little harsh on them, that diplomacy was a sort of form of appeasement. You know, the, the question, you were uh, looking for a way around a problem and you might have to surrender something to get what you wanted. Um, so she was always suspicious of the institution, uh, but she admired individuals. And one of the people she admired particularly was uh, Tony Parsons at the UN, who contrived to get UN support for a resolution which became almost the basis of our future action. Next began a long and tiring round of shuttle diplomacy by US Secretary of State Al Haig. All the diplomatic efforts, including Al Haig, were to leave them there and to avoid a war, uh, avoid uh, a counter-invasion, if you like. And really, the story of the first phase of the campaign, if you like, while the fleet is steaming now, is uh, all kinds of meddlers around the world trying to achieve uh, a compromise in which the Argentine remain in charge of the islands. Well, it was never on. And I mean, the British public wouldn't have tolerated that. The task force arrived at Ascension Island in the South Atlantic on the 16th of April. 
Nine days later, on the 25th of April, South Georgia was recaptured. News of the event was delivered by John Knott to the press gathered outside Downing Street. The commander of the operation has sent the following message. Be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next, what, Mr. Knott? Thank you very much. What's your reaction, Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to night, declare gentlemen. war on Argentina, Mr. Thatcher? All kinds of people said that this was not an appropriate response. Well, I've never understood what would be a more appropriate response. And yet all we got them with virtually no loss of life, as far as I know. Uh, we'd recovered them. Uh, we weren't going to moan, were we? She couldn't conceivably say, moan, moan. No, I mean, really, I think people who wanted to uh, uh, take a, a bite out of her just would pick on anything and rejoice, rejoice was a, uh, a, a, a reason to have a go at her, but I've never understood it. Diplomatic efforts to resolve the conflict were getting nowhere. In a series of interviews on April the 30th, President Reagan backed Britain's right to take back the Falklands. If there was any remaining hope for a diplomatic solution, that ended with the sinking of the Belgrano on May the 2nd, with the loss of 368 crew. We knew they were up to no good, and they believed that the 25th of May, cruiser, I think it was, and uh, the Belgrano were, whatever they were doing and wherever they were steaming at the moment, uh, were involved in a pincer movement. And therefore, the decision was given to sink it. <coughs> and it sank. Uh, and there were 300 or more Argentinian lives lost. Now, you don't rejoice at the loss of life, but you do rejoice at the uh, elimination of a battleship that could place the lives of your troops and sailors and airmen in very serious jeopardy. Two days later, the task force suffered its first heavy casualty with the sinking of HMS Sheffield and the loss of 21 lives. We feel deep sorrow for the loss of our ship, for which we had great affection. We feel considerable anger that we were struck in the first place. We feel particularly frustration that we're not still fighting alongside the task force. We're talking about seconds to react rather than minutes. And uh, I hope, I'm sure you will appreciate that uh, a missile which comes in uh, less than 12 feet off the deck at uh, very high speed, many hundreds of miles an hour, uh, gives us a very short time of response. Uh, and we saw it at a stage at which there was really no time to do anything other than uh, for those who were in the immediate vicinity of the small number of people who saw this missile appearing, only had time to, uh, to say, take cover and we're talking about three or four seconds later, the missile striking HMS Sheffield. The loss of life had a profound effect on the Prime Minister. It did upset her, but it, she never wavered at all. I mean, she, and this was what the military had been very worried about. How will she react to something like the Sheffield, you know, if it happens? Well, I mean, she was deeply upset, but it never affected her judgment or her determination. The Tory party chairman, Mr Cecil Parkinson, had warned earlier, we are approaching a decisive phase in the crisis. On Tuesday the 18th of May, the War Cabinet met with all the Chiefs of Staff, and a decision was taken to go ahead with a landing on the Falklands, subject to Cabinet approval. The day uh, we took the decision to go in, Perez de Cuellar, the UN Secretary General, said, the Argentinians, effectively, the Argentinians are hopeless. The British have done everything that could be expected of them. I can do no more. Well, from that moment, we were, that was the moment. From then on, it was up to us to choose the time. And so uh, we didn't want to keep our troops bouncing around on ships. So the decision was taken to go in. Did we really expect to 
suffer such casualties, four ships sunk in as many days, and as many again damaged. On May the 21st, British troops landed at San Carlos, but then came under enemy fire from the air. The frigate HMS Ardent was lost. Another frigate, HMS Argonaut, and a destroyer, HMS Brilliant, were both badly damaged. Her decks were packed with vehicles and munitions, and deep inside her were two unexploded bombs. The loss of ships was a blow, but the first objective was achieved. 5,000 men had safely landed. The landing also brought to an end Britain's preparedness to negotiate. We tried, but they're not going to get off of their own volition, therefore they have to be removed. The real difficulty would have been if we'd have had severe losses when they were landing. But another miracle was that they got, five, I think, 5,000 odd troops ashore with scarcely a casualty. Now, fully committed to military action on the 27th of May, the troops moved in on Goose Green, and the battle was fierce. At first light, the full extent of the horror of the fighting became apparent. The thick gorse that had hidden Argentine bunkers was still ablaze or smoking after what had been a furious battle. With Argentine surrender came freedom for the people of Goose Green, who'd been imprisoned inside their community hall for three weeks. Both sides took casualties. Many of the troops sustained injury and several lost their lives, including one of the more famous casualties of the war, Colonel H. Jones, the commander of two para, who lost his life in securing the way forward for his troops. He was buried along with his men. Lieutenant Colonel Jones. Captain Wood, Captain Dane, Lieutenant Barry. As military action intensified, so once again the Americans tried to revive diplomatic negotiations. At the same time, UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuella advanced a five-point peace plan. There were calls for a ceasefire. I don't think Mrs. Thatcher, after the initial fumbling uh, and great doubt and deep natural concern. I don't think that she contemplated continuation of any dual track. We were going to war and the faster we went to war uh, the better. I know that her view was not unanim unanimously shared amongst senior responsible officers but to their credit they're not inclined to refuse the political will of a democratically elected government. In the Falklands, preparations were being made for the final assault on Port Stanley. Support troops, equipment and ammunition had been moved from San Carlos to Bluff Cove and Fitzroy, from where soldiers would advance on the capital. Before the operation was complete, however, the British troops were subject to devastating attack by the Argentines. The Skyhawks came in to attack and were out again with our gunfire chasing them too late. So sudden, so unannounced, we knew nothing until we saw the black smoke billowing out of the landing ship, Sir Galahad, and then the first signs of a fire aboard St. Tristram nearby. The attack happened so fast, again. there wasn't even time to think of taking cover. And as the ships were hit, many men aboard hadn't even time to pull on their anti-burn masks to save themselves from the heat flash as the bombs exploded. The two landing ships, Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram, were bombed within 200 yards of each other as they were unloading supplies of ammunition and of men. The bombs hit Sir Galahad aft through the engine room and accommodation sections. I watched from the shore less than 400 yards away and felt the impact on the ground below me as the hold full of ammunition exploded. Many were brought ashore with dreadful burns. Bullets came from their ammunition boxes, exploding in the heat, whistling and whirring past us. The brutal reality of war made a deep impression on Mrs. Thatcher. 
to have the kind of blow that the Welsh guards took at Loughcoe was a, a, a pretty awful thing. And But you see, you are leader of the nation. You have to show tremendous reserves of fortitude in these circumstances. And there's no good going to pieces. That won't do anybody any good, least of all the, uh, the survivors. So you have, some people will say, you have to put on a front. Uh, but you have to demonstrate that you are a leader in these circumstances because that's what you are. In the days that followed, a military bombardment of Argentinian positions prepared the way for the final push for Port Stanley. From the two sisters, the Royal Marines treaded their way carefully down the pass, but the route was blocked by minefields, and every few minutes the column dragged to a halt as the way was carefully cleared. Once the military campaign started to roll, it was out of our hands. Then it was a question where our troops, soldiers, better than theirs, could, could they prevail, and of course they did. But um, we were, to an extent, from that moment, once the campaign really started to roll, uh, we were getting reports rather than influencing events at all. On the 14th of June, the Argentines surrendered. White flags were flying over Port Stanley. It was, I think, a very considerable feat of, uh, you know, arms to go all that way, 8,000 miles, and uh, defeat a power which had, you know, a navy of its own, had an air force of its own, all the rest of it. Um, so I think it, it, in military terms, it was perhaps a little bit kind of nostalgic, but it was nonetheless a considerable achievement. That evening, back in London, Margaret Thatcher went to the House of Commons and, on a point of order, announced the victory. Cheers resounded throughout the house. And outside, in Whitehall and Downing Street, the crowds greeted Mrs Thatcher as the conquering hero. She always had this Joan of Arc capacity to know that what she was doing was right, and I don't think that she probably doubted for a moment that it was going to come out uh, successfully in the end. I think she uh, must have known that she had a lot more windier colleagues who were much more apprehensive. But I think that she obviously did feel vindicated when it was all over. Within days of the Argentine surrender, General Galtieri and his military junta were removed from power. Democracy was restored to Argentina in 1983. There had always been a quite a close sort of Anglo-Argentine uh, relationship. Um, and I don't think it devastated it. It obviously, there were people who were grateful to Thatcher for the overthrow of the dictatorship. And uh, a lot of people lost their lives, disappeared ones and all that. And without, I think, our defense of the Falklands, the junta would not have been overthrown. So there may be even be people in the, uh, the Argentine who actually are grateful for what we did. When on the 21st of July, the aircraft carrier HMS Hermes arrived back home, laden with troops and helicopters, Mrs. Thatcher was the first to greet them. In congratulating all on board on their triumph, she was celebrating her own. Oh, don't talk about me. That's the scoreboard. Look at that. That's the scoreboard of achievement. I think they recognize that they've got a quite exceptional woman here. I, mean, they, I think they realize it, or we're beginning to realize it, before the Falklands, notwithstanding the huge increase in unemployment, but I think they were beginning to realize that there was, there was something of exceptional quality in this woman. After the Falklands, they knew. This is the most fantastic operation that we've undertaken. We're all very privileged to have taken part in it. And I couldn't have her coming in without coming to work with her. The public, too, was keen to celebrate the safe return of our boys. There was just a, a feeling of admiration for the job that our troops and our airmen and sailors had done. I mean, to operate eight and a half thousand miles from home with your nearest land base four and a half thousand miles away and to be successful was, it was an astonishing feat of arms uh, and people were hugely impressed by 
the professionalism and the skill and the bravery of our forces. Seven months after the war had ended, Mrs. Thatcher paid her own visit to the Falklands. Oh, this is lovely. This is a typical house. This is a typical size. A typical size house. It was her first visit to the islands and an opportunity to meet the people for whom she had risked her political future and the lives of many British servicemen and women. To maintain peace with freedom and justice is always expensive. It's less expensive than war, particularly in human life. Might there be a time when we talk to the Argentines again? No, not on sovereignty. One thing the islanders have made it perfectly clear, these islands are British. They are the Queen's loyal subjects. They wish it to stay that way. The Falklands had a huge impact on Margaret Thatcher. They had, uh, she didn't become arrogant, but they gave a real boost to her self-confidence because, you know, she must have had her doubts. First woman prime minister going to war, heading up a war cabinet. And she handled it, and she handled it brilliantly, and she came out of it with a lot of unlikely admirers, like virtually the whole of our forces. Margaret Thatcher's popularity was at its height. Her triumph was the result of political nerve and enormous good luck. Her military success would later guarantee her a second term in office. But perhaps most significantly, it would increase Mrs. Thatcher's confidence in her own judgment, her own sense of being right. She was now unassailable. In the next programme, how Margaret Thatcher bestrode the world stage and the truth about that special relationship. You can order Margaret Thatcher, a tribute in words and pictures, for the special half-price fee of £10. Call Telegraph Books on 0870 155 7222 or order online at www.books.telegraph.co.uk.